thank you for uh, inviting me up here and driving me up here for this meeting. Um, I've spoken in Leicestershire a couple of times before, I think this is the fourth time. I'd like to start by telling people what I know of the court case, uh, which was sort of semi-resolved this afternoon. It appears that the media, which I haven't seen, is saying that the case was lost and that no new members since the court proceedings began can be allowed. But my belief that this isn't technically true, they're going on the headline. What I think has happened is the judge has thrown out most of the case from Phillips's Human Rights and Equality Commission, but a linkage between the principles and the constitution, which might technically mean that quote unquote ethnic members might have to agree to partly repatriate themselves as part of, re of joining, be disconnected from the constitution proper. But rather than rewrite the constitution, this means removing a particular section which has been found to be objective. Once that is in turn removed, which can be done of course very easily, and a new draft on a computer of the same document prepared for the court, it means that you can take on new members. My understanding is that the backlog of new members has been partially dealt with today and that £15,000 worth of new memberships will process today after the judgment. So whether the Human Rights Commission goes back to court to try and contest this remains to be seen, but it's probably unlikely. The motivation for this case was political, quite obviously. Phillips is under a lot of pressure in that bureaucracy because two members of the European Parliament were elected and to a certain extent the appear before Richard Barnborough was elected in London to the Greater London Assembly. So Oosley and others who were his predecessors of the Human Rights Commission when it was known as the Commission for Racial Equality and the Attendant Commission for Sexual Equality have put pressure on Phillips to do something about the rise of this party. Uh, I don't need to tell you that his commission receives £100 million pounds sterling a year. £100 million. And it's the amalgamation of all of the equality lobbies and attendant bureaucracies that used to be separate. There used to be, late in the 1960s, a race relations board under Wilson's regime then, which then came forward into the Commission for Racial Equality in 74-5, again under Wilson, sort of old Labour, pre-New Labour, if you like. Then it became the sort of late Commission for Racial Equality heading towards the Human Rights Commission. It merged in with the Gender Equality, Commission for Sexual Equality Bureau, but it's also had homosexuality, transgender specification, and disability added to it. Uh, Labour has passed 10 to 12 acts since 97 under different Home Secretaries which relate to the issue of equality, what can be said, what can't be said, what can be done in law, what can be done if you're running a guest house, and so on and so forth. Most of these laws people are only dimly aware of. Uh, people in the media are terrified of the slightest non-compliance with some of this politically correct legislation, which is why everything that's broadcast by the BBC, certainly that's prepared to air and isn't live, goes to a compliance unit inside the corporation, which checks it in relation to these laws. It basically means that you can't really offend almost anybody these days, except maybe the English. You can offend them as much as you like. There's, uh, there's, uh, so that's basically what's been done. I doubt if the European seats have been won that this will be coming forward. After all, Labour's been in for 13 years. They've had the better part of a decade and a half to bring this legislation forward. Why are they waiting till the fag end of the last brown period before they go down to some sort of defeat in mid-year? Because Labour's not going to have a majority after May the 6th. They may be in power with another party, they may have a minority government, there may be a Tory minority government, there might be a grand coalition, there could be a liberal Labour pact as there was in the late 70s between Steele and Callaghan, and there could maybe be some sort of hybrid liberal Tory pact. In some, pact, in some ways, Clegg and Cameron would go very well together, given that they're almost semi-interchangeable politicians from our point of view. Now, there's a degree to which this attempt to get certain persons to come forward and have the chance to join this organisation is an attempt obviously to disrupt the organisation from without, it's an attempt to sow divisions between people, get certain people to peel off on the outer edge of the party and join more hardline groups, as well as create divisions internally. We all know there are stresses and tensions in all political groupings around personality and other things. 
people who are slightly more moderate than others can possibly chafe at bringing certain people along and cause tension and difficulty for certain organisers. This is particularly acute in some of the cities. Now all of this in some ways can be managed and there are different ways to do so. Most of the continental parties that are described as far-right parties have essentially had to acquiesce in all sorts of laws and go along with them because they believe the important thing is to stand as a, as a machine at every election, local, regional, federal, or whatever they have there for their states constituted in France, Italy, Austria, Belgium, the Federal Republic of Germany and elsewhere. We will have probably have to adopt the same hard-faced sort of attitude. In about 1996 or thereabouts, I attended the red, white and blue of the Front National in France. And to a, to a degree, I knew Jean-Marie Le Pen. And there's a degree to which there was 125,000 people at that event. Not 2,000 people, not 1,500 people, not 900 people, not 3,500 people, but 125,000 people. And a later one, before the French state banned it, in 2003 or thereabouts, there was a quarter of a million people. A quarter of a million people. It was extraordinary. They used to have it at the racetrack, which is a particular district on the outer suburban edge of Paris. The French state banned it, saying it was a danger to health and safety. But there were rock, rock concerts of Jean Michel Jarre and these people who are listened to by listened to by no one who isn't French. But in France, they have enormous audiences, and 300,000 attended his concerts uh, in the same place. So there's no question that that was done for nothing other than political reasons. But we have this essential sea, essentially, sea of white French faces, as it were, stretching to the horizon, basically. And you would have 60 ethnic individuals from Guadeloupe and elsewhere, 60 out of a quarter of a million. And that's how the Front National basically dealt with that. The reason for all of these antics and jiggery pokery and essentially messing about is to prevent an organisation like this from springing up at election time and for people who are sick of the Liberal Labour Tory coalition, as was and is, to have something to vote for. They have to have something to vote for which is against the system, which is against that which is constituted today, in the past and in the future. This party is a danger to the ruling establishment. When Blunkett was uh, Home Secretary, before they split the Home Secretary into two bureaus as they now do, Home and Justice, Blunkett said wherever the British National Party wins at local, regional or national level or devolved level in Scotland and Wales, they are a threat to this society as it currently exists, as Liberals have created it over the last 50 to 60 years. And that is essentially true. Most of the comments made by the new Labour elite against a party like this that they perceive as their real enemy internally, the enemy within, in their own jargon, is in their own way of looking at things true. Much of the blather between the parties, who agree on 80% of the agenda and argue ferociously about the 20% that remains, about which they differ in terms of implementation, is froth and turns the mass of the public off as they increasingly realise that these parties, the blue one, the red one and the orange and yellow one are sort of interchangeable. But in relation to this party, it disagrees with the others 80%. There might be the odd correlation on this and that, because we're all living in the same country, on 20% of matters. But on 80% plus, there's a total difference. So when Blunkett says that there is a danger to the entire system and society, he means politically and ideologically and philosophically and structurally, he's right. He's not being alarmist, he's not being a fool, he's not stirring the pot unnecessarily. They know the sort of cross society that they created in the last 50 years, and they know that they didn't do it with the consent of the British majority, and they didn't do it with the consent of people here in Leicestershire. As I'm sure you realise, Leicester is England's and Britain's first ethnic city. Leicester is the first city where if you aggregate all the minorities together, it, they are a majority. Of course, these people have little in common with each other, but aggregated so together, they are a majority and the indigenous population, a phrase that the uh, constitutional mongers in the courts and in the electricity's Human Rights Commission don't care for, are in a minority. It's something like 51-49, 52-48 in Leicester. I don't know Leicester very well, but when I met, I went there a couple of times in the last five years, it struck me that like a lot of our urban spaces, it's been effectively ruined at several different levels. It's been ruined demographically, it seemed to be slightly ruined as a southerner like me by putting a motorway or several motorways right through the heart of it, which is what they've done with Leeds and various other cities. 
Uh, they seem to have knocked down some of the best buildings and some of the Victorian quarter. So you can see, <coughs> and I'm doing it from the outside, that there's levels of destruction going on in the last 40 to 50 to 60 years. Biological destruction and decay, architectural and physical semi-devastation, and sort of urban planning. What Wilson in the 1960s called the white heat of technology. Do you remember all that? The white heat that would uh, sort of bring us into a new era, like the atomic sort of promise that was offered to a generation slightly before that. Where's all that white heat of technology gone? All the people who were bombed out in the war in the big cities, say in the east end of London, and these great tower blocks that were sprung up in the big cities, most of them are being blitzed or blown up or taken down in inner Birmingham, in inner Glasgow, in inner London. They're being taken down because of the eyesores and rat runs that they became for the people who were bombed out during the war and stuffed into them, into the, uh, into them in the new peace that came thereafter with the Labour landslides in 45 and the Labour governments from 64 through to 70 and 74 through to 79. Now since 1997, New Labour has come in and been re-elected three times. The problem with many of our people is that they can't see what's genuinely in front of them. Everyone with any sense at all realised that there wasn't some magic antidote to the major years. Remember the major years at the end, Tory MPs holding up sort of um, manila envelopes full of, uh, you know, some dubious questions in their mouths, waiting for the envelope to be filled with thousands. It's a very sordid period. The Tories have been here for about 20 years. They were tired. They were dying. They had no new ideas. They were swept away. I remember going to a polling booth on that very Thursday, and you could see the anger in people's faces. They wanted to punish Major and the Tories, and uh, had a 180 majority for Labour. Extraordinary. Even in middle class areas, the Tories were swept out in the biggest defeat they've had since 1832. And what comes in? New Labour comes in. And uh, Labour promised a sort of a new deal and a new change, a differentiated version of Wilson's promise of the white heat of technology or in the 60s or the rebuilding of the society under Attlee after 1945. And what has happened since 1997? This country is bankrupted now to several dimensions. The amounts of money that the country owes is astronomical. We are spending enormous amounts of money as if there is no tomorrow in order to prop up capitalist banks, at least half of which went bankrupt about a year and a half to two years ago. It's an extraordinary situation that we are now in, that if Lloyds had collapsed, and if NatWest Royal Bank of Scotland had collapsed, about a fifth to a quarter to a third of the population would have gone to these machines and put the card in the machine, and no money would have come out. And similarly, certain proportion of benefits wouldn't have been paid either. You're talking about recessionary change of a sort that Western societies have not seen since the Great Crash in 1929-1930. Brown said he had abolished boom and bust, but in actual fact there was a boom and now it's well and truly busted. And he managed to get out of number 11 Downing Street just before it occurred and move over to number 10 to replace Blair, as he always plotted to do, as he always wanted to do. Because Blair was an actor and a performer and an artiste and a sort of mountebank and a pathological liar. And it took about 10 years for British people to work out what it was like. Blair could argue for a position over there, and then he could go over there and argue with equal sincerity against the position that he'd just enunciated. He was a performer. Somebody was more like sort of one of these stars of soap operas and so on than a politician. The interesting thing is that the British people trusted him once and then again, and then to a slightly lesser extent, even again. But the greatest damage that New Labour has done to the society isn't the Iraq War, important though that is, in relation to the Chilcot inquiry that's going on at the moment. It's not even the economic crash, substantial and devastating though that is for many, particularly as we face the prospect of a double dip recession. The real damage that they've done to the society is the opening up, and then the opening up again, and then the opening up again to mass migration from the second, the third, and the fourth world, which between about 1999 and 2003 4 has changed the nature of the island and its internal demography out of all recognition. Parts of inner London now, parts of inner Birmingham now, Hansworth, 80% non white. <coughs> 
parts of the East End of London are literally in the third world. Areas like Dalston or Greater Hackney or parts of Stoke Newington or elements of the Beauvoir Town or elements of Lambeth, south of the river, parts of Newham and so on. It's as if virtually we don't exist there anymore. Nearly all of the indigenous people have got out of these areas, have fled out of them. The only people who are left are the people who are too old or too sick or too poor and can't get out. And about four to five years ago, there were lots of Polish, some Ukrainian and other immigrants who come into the European Union, good license, to take cheap jobs during the trashiest part of the credit and debt fuel boom cycle that was then riding high. And Brown said he was the Iron Chancellor, who was controlled movements of capital, controlled movements of labour, which is what migration is. You have a system now where our economy and most Western economies is locked into global structures of power and finance, where great walls of money move across the world at the touch of a screen in the city bureaus of London, Leeds, Glasgow, or wherever, where jobs move from the south of England to the north of England to Hungary to China to Indonesia, and they're undercut at each level. As lots of people work in and around or just under to just around or just over the minimum wage. Any trouble, they're out, and they're replaced by somebody else. And in order to have an economy where you can have a mobile phone at three in the morning, or have a pizza at four in the morning, or have a plasma dish to arrive at your door in a van um, with a man with a cat at five in the morning, and you play with some plastic, and you pay on the never never, and that this all goes on 24 hours a day, with a bit of a blip on Easter day, a bit of a blip on Christmas day, but otherwise it's full on. Full on consumption without production fueled by debt and based upon credit. And the flip side to all this cheap and easy money which builds up almost like interconnected pyramid schemes or scams or forms of fraud if a private individual did them, which is what many of these institutions and banks got themselves into, the flip side of this is the mass movement of people all over the world swarming after the money, crossing over borders, crossing over continents, getting up into Europe from Africa through the Arab countries in the Libyan desert and um, Gaddafi's forces throw them back and allow some through and they, some die in the Mediterranean, others are sunk by Italian patrol boats, a certain proportion get in. Mafias in Turkey and elsewhere funnel people in, other people are trying to get out of Albania or out of the old Yugoslavia into the underside of the European Union. Great swathes of people are coming from war zones which have been created by the policies of certain Western leaders in Iraq, in Afghanistan, maybe in the next couple of years in Iran, because major structural changes in world power are coming. It's difficult to predict the future, but I think we're living in a very, very radical age. 100 years ago, 1910, we ruled a quarter of the planet. We had many internal pro problems, particularly in relation to slums, poverty, and much else. But we were a major society, and a largely organic society as well, a feared society. It's different, but we virtually had the status in the world that the United States, for good or ill, has now. It's slid, it's moved downwards in every sense, certainly since 1946-48, lost the Raj in 48, were bankrupted in order to destroy fascism in 1945, had to be bowed out and rescued by the United States in the post-war labor period. Mass migration begins in 48, it begins very, very slowly, and as an alleged recompense for our empire, it then becomes more of a flood as you get more of a desire for more and more cheap labour to fuel the fact that we're increasingly just living on financial services and consumption. We produce virtually nothing. We once built the world's ships, the world's planes, the world's tanks, the world's cars, the world's motorbikes. We now make nothing. We add value at points of post-production in relation to things which are made elsewhere. And we make money from the circulation of money and we balance it all by the value of our houses, which for the broad and extended middle class goes up and up and up, particularly in the southern part of the kingdom, in or out of all proportion to what the value of the thing actually is. So all of these factors, easy credit, cheap money, banks playing roulette, split off from the normal banking function and doing it through the City of London. Mass movement of money all around the world for the biggest return. 
and mass migration as people come in, seeing their chance, and with liberal elites that either favour this, or don't want to do anything about it, or are too hamstrung by their own ideas that they go to college and elsewhere, to even attempt to do so. My view is that it's a, a deliberate attempt, a pre-planned attempt, a chaotic sh chimera and imbroglio, and also just the chaos that liberalism brings in its way. Yeah. And you see chaos in all areas. You see it in the health service. And all this stuff about Stafford Hospital, did you see that the other week? They're left to die in <coughs> corridors. They're sort of dying in their own feces in wards. There's basically too few nurses and too few doctors because they were wanted a, a foundation status, which is a silly little bureaucratic norm that New Labour introduced to allegedly improve things, and it led to the shattering of that hospital. By the time the special measures people went in, Stafford General Hospital was in the third world. It wasn't a first world facility, it was in the third world. People in Stafford actually have cut signs in their cars which say if they're involved in an accident, they do not want to be taken to Stafford General. <laughs> this is the way that uh, our institutions have been degraded over time. And this is just one example of one hospital in one area. Do you remember about 10 years ago there were those um, photos from a mortuary at a hospital in Norwich in East Anglia where the corpses of the dead were piled up because there wasn't anywhere else for them to be put and they were sort of shoved out into a room like this or some gymnasium, gymnasium that was adjacent to the hospital facilities. This is the National Health Service that the Tories opposed, that the doctors opposed when it was created, not the line they now pursue, and that Labour introduced in the teeth of such opposition and yet... This is a system that is crumbling in many respects. And although some of the criticism by the Republican right in the United States about the NHS is overdone because of their fear of social medicine and their only concern is with the people who've got the money to pay for it, nevertheless, there is a crippled element to the NHS here. And New Labour are responsible for it, as they are responsible for the chaos in the schools. Mass comprehensivisation was introduced by Shirley Williams in the 1970s. It was an attempt to improve standards, to remove elitism, to provide opportunity, to increase tolerance. All these things that Labourites talk about. The subtext is they will not send their own children to these schools. They won't send their own children to these schools because they know what has happened to them. That in many schools in the big cities, 16-year-olds come out barely literate, barely numerate, speaking like Jamaican gangsters, knowing nothing about their own culture, knowing nothing about their own history, and with little future in the society that's coming. A third of all 16 to 23-year-olds are unemployed. And whenever you go for a job now, even if it's swabbing toilets, they say, where's your experience? We haven't had any experience. You haven't got any. And they go, you can't get that job, can you? Can you? And so there's going to be a large generation now within this new type of recession that is growing up that will know absolute sort of unemployment. If you don't get a job between 18 and 30, Brown wants to keep everyone in school. But there is a bit you do have to leave eventually. And we'll have this society that's very old, very much in debt, where the young don't work, where we don't produce anything, and yet still hundreds of thousands and millions of people are flooding in. Since um, 1997, about three million people have gone to live in Spain and in Australia and in America and elsewhere. But this is a very small country and there is no escape. We have to, in a sense, return to certain fundamental standards and verities here inside this society. When Cameron says Britain is broken, there is a minor resonance within the society. But people, I think, have stopped listening to Cameron quite a long time ago. But when he says that Britain is broken, and there, a few people do still pick their ears up, prick their ears up a little bit. Because Britain is broken, but it's broken in a way he doesn't even begin to configure. Because the radicalism of what has occurred, and how this country in certain respects has slid off the civilised map in many areas, um, is quite breathtaking in many respects. A certain proportion of people who are comfortable in the society close their eyes and close their doors and close their gates to what is happening. You see it particularly in the big cities where many people increasingly live in gated estates. These are these estates that have 24-hour security, have cameras on the outside of the estate. You need going through a gate to get in. 
You had to swipe a card to get in, like these hotels, you know? You swipe the card and the gate opens and there's something heavy on the inside and this sort of thing. This is how the rich live in third world countries, where the daughter of a rich, uh, of a rich man has a heavy with a Kalashnikov with her when she goes to the shops. And this is because in societies like Venezuela, it's a jungle out there, and it's violent and rough, and there's little social benefits, and there's enormous illicit shanty towns on the edge of cities. In our cities, these sorts of areas are in the middle, the inner city. In France, the value, they're on the outside, the suburbs. But it's the same phenomenon which is occurring all over the West. Certain crimes transfigure the society in relation to their ferocity and their psychopathic mania. I'd just like to uh, draw attention just for a moment to the Bulger case and to the recent antics involving the returns of venables to prison. This is, these cases take on an iconic <coughs> register, particularly in a declining culture. Because although, as liberals say, it's not entirely logical, people see, and these are very aberrant crimes, Something which says something about a larger sweep of chaos and decay and the collapse of the family as the middling structure between the individual and the state. Now these crimes are abnormal, even in terms of criminality. But they are also in their treatment and in the outrage of the public about them and how they're resolved by the courts, indicative of a liberal society. The tabloids play games, they have their own agendas, they, can't, they like to whip up a mob spirit for their own potential good and in order to make money. But they are feeding on the anger of the public about these sorts of unresolved matters. The truth is that these types of crimes actually confront certain liberal theories about man and woman and mankind and our nature. When Blunkett was, and I mentioned him earlier in this talk, was Home Secretary, he released Venables and Thompson because he thought they could be reformed or they had been reformed. And that's a mistaken view. Because both of them are psychopaths, and Venables in my view particularly so, and they were born that way. They were born that way. And there's a lot of genetic and biological evidence to this fact. They will not change, which is why he's been returned to prison for a grotesque and egregious offence. The public may not know the details of the biology, they may not know that extreme psychopaths think that love is hate and rape is normal sex and to kill an individual is the equivalent of killing a fly. They don't necessarily know that the people in Ashworth and Broadmoor and Rampton, the hospitals for the criminally insane who are psychopaths, have that sort of condition. They actually lack certain chromosomes in their own biological nature, which means they have no sympathy for anything. This case in South Yorkshire recently involving those two boys who tried to kill two other boys is of a similar register. Had they been the age of the Bulger toddler, they would have been murdered just the same. My view is that when Venables and Thompson reached 18, they should have been hanged instead of being released. I don't believe in hanging children. Therefore, when they're 10, you keep them in the special unit till they're 18. When they're 18, they're sentient, they're adult, they're aware retrospectively of what they've done. They can't be changed. They can't be redeemed. They can't be transformed. And therefore, in a sense, a morally conscious act to execute them in a way that they themselves would understand, I think is fitting and licit and would draw a line under these sorts of offences. Liberals can never make their minds up about anything. Oh, you know, the victim is a sideshow, but at the same time we're sorry for them, and Venables is the real victim, and he's had a harsh background, and a pink teddy was taken off him when he was three, and he's had a hard life, you know, haven't got any sympathy, this sort of thing. Yet at the same time, when confronted with the mother and the bulger toddler, they're in pieces and they're wringing their hands. It's because their view of life is false. And if it's view of uh, their life is false about very, very extreme matters, on the margins of law, on the margins of crime, on the margins of mental illness, on the margins of human life. It's going to be false about all sorts of other things that are more central, if you like, to human experience, and are further in. Nearly all of their views about all of the matters that are discussed night after night in the mass media are false. 
that men and women are the same, that they're interchangeable, that all groups are the same, that they can all live on the same territory, that amity and cooperation is natural to man, when warfare and conflict has been natural to man since the very beginning, when humans are biologically tribal and communitarian to such a degree that it takes a lot for many people to even not to distrust people in their own group from other sections of that group or other parts of a country. It's difficult enough to knit a country together over centuries, if not millennia. Then the idea that everyone can live in each other's country is a recipe for alienation and chaos, particularly if you have a very small territory. England fits into Texas 12 times, Britain fits into Texas 8 times. There's a degree to which many Americans can move or think that they can move. The San Francisco Chronicle had an article last week which said that white Americans will be in an absolute minority inside the United States in 40 years. That's 2050, slightly quicker than was presented before. It was said to be 50 or 60 years. This means that the premier society in the West, which is in part the model that the Anglophone and the rest of the West is following, namely ourselves, is indeed the model for the decay that we are all experiencing. I was in the Southern States of the United States of America not too long ago. There's still quite a bit of kick. There's still quite a bit of power inside the US if you go there and just look at it with your eyes open. But still, America is in radical decline. When Booker T. Washington, who was the leader of black America, went to see President Theodore Roosevelt at the beginning of the 20th century, there was howls of outrages from whites. There was tens of thousands of letters saying the president shouldn't have allowed him to enter the White House. The Ku Klux Klan had a march of four million people, four million, in the early 1920s, which led to the all-white immigration policy that then characterized American life until the late 1960s. Now a third of America is non-white. And Obama is president. And 70 million persons have entered, 70 million, have entered the United States of America from the third world, from the second world, from the fourth world, since the late 1960s. American cities have been changed out of all recognition. People who, you know, sit watching sort of John Wayne movies from the 1950s and 1960s have a view of America that is so out of kilter with what the reality is now that they're basically looking at a sort of time capsule bubble for their own entertainment on DVD or whatever else. Obama's presidency signifies the sort of death knell of a certain conceptuality within the West. This is particularly relevant for British people. Although we often don't like what America does, many people in America are descended from us, are very similar in the way that they behave to us. Your average post-British white American in Kansas or elsewhere has no control over what his government does in his name within the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and that's an enclosed elite, just as we have no say whatsoever in relation to what Blair does, or in relation to what Brown does, or in relation to what Blunkett did when he was Home Secretary. All of it did are done in our name. One of the most stupid things that's been done in the last ten years is these third world wars, or these wars in the third world, which are done in our name and yet have introduced simultaneously large groups from the populations of the countries that are being attacked by American and Western power into our own society. Logically, you either don't allow them in and you don't attack them, or you don't allow them in and for whatever reason you do attack them. But you don't attack them after you have let large numbers of them settle in your own society and then go with American power to bomb and destroy and devastate the tribal areas in Pakistan, Waziristan, and elsewhere to fight in the southern deserts of Helmand in southeast Afghanistan. I know people who are there now. And the war in Afghanistan is very, very tough. British troops are fighting full on with a ferocity and violence in person-to-person -person contact, as soldiers call it, as ferocious as has been seen since the Korean War, or since the uh, Tet Offensive in the Vietnam War, where the Viet Cong and the American Marine Corps clash head-to-head -head in a ferocious, really ferocious conflict. The Taliban are brave people. They fight for every village, for every space of land. They retreat, they plant bombs everywhere, they invite you in, they'll kill themselves before they surrender. And they're Pashtuns, they're not lords to Afghanistan, they hate the Afghan government and its police because they're Tajiks, who are another group. In the town I went to school in, there's a big monument and a big lion in the centre of that town, and people think it relates to the 1914-1918 war. 
the First World War and the mass slaughter on the Somme and elsewhere. It doesn't. It relates to the 1890 conflict in Afghanistan where Lord Roberts had some major losses after a few successes, it has to be said, in relation to the same people we're fighting in Afghanistan now. We don't need to be in Afghanistan. We're not there to fight to put a democracy in place. These people don't believe in democracy anyway and will tear it to pieces long after we've gone. They support their tribal elder, they support their own blood clan. If one of their groups killed, they all come together to revenge themselves as a clan. They're born gun in hand. This is their life and their land. Leave it to them. Yeah. 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 Leave them to live in their own land. <laughs> Just as we wish to be on our, alone here, to live in our own. Yeah. Yeah. Our imperial period is over. Uh, there's a, many sort of old or nostalgic conservatives, even a bit of me, uh, regrets the imperial passage, but as Enoch Powell said in the middle of the last century, it is over. When he was asked, Enoch, to join the Suez group, the pro-imperial group of Tory MPs, they're not left on the back benches, not on the front benches. He said, I'm not going to do it, because it's over. And we have to realise that these wars in Palestine and Cyprus and the other places that we fought in in the 50s and thereafter and late 40s were the bad end of empire. It's the end of empire. What we've had is we've had the backwash of empire to such a degree that the people we once ruled now rule in Leicester. We've had a complete reversal of what we once were as a society to such a degree that people flood out of cities like Leicester, for example, but there are many others to choose from, and if they can live in the towns, hamlets, semi-towns, large urban villages and so on, got pocketed round about. Two million people have flooded out of London to get away from what's happening. Not one of the mainstream candidates who stands for mayor in London, Livingston, who's all in favour of it and so on, and Johnson and so on, would speak about it. Johnson wants to legitimise, and he's the Tory mayor, Tory, not Labour, not even old Labour and dissident of that, the way Livingston was, playing those populist left games of group against group within the capital. There are 450,000 illegal migrants in London alone. 450,000. And Johnson wants to legalise their status in the capital so they can all pay tax. And he thinks this is a happening deal and a good bit of progressive Cameroonian conservatism as he perceives it. Because all, of the, all that they've become is they become like New York mayors. They become people who appeal to this group and this group and they say one evening I'm with you, they say another evening I'm with you. Livingston is the first one in some ways to work out what this type of new big city <coughs> politics is like. On Monday, he'll be with a Muslim group, uh, when he was mayor anyway, and even now because he wants to run as mayor again, and he'll say I'm with you and all the rest of it. On Tuesday he'll be in Islington with a gay group. And he'll say, I'm with you, not realising that these groups are completely antithetical, but they all can be put together because they all have an enemy that's the same. Or that they can perceive of as some sort of a threat to themselves. Every festival from everywhere in the world was permitted under Livingston. He gave Black History Month £123,000 every November. Every library in London, Black History Month is rolled out. It's not an accident, you know. If you're all some obscure librarian in Kentish Town and you say, I want to vote off tower of Black History Month, <laughs> that's, that's not permitted, you know. It's right across London, indeed, it's right across Britain. Now, Black History Month has rather come to an end because there isn't very much Black History to have a month about. So, <laughs> so the months get shorter every year by a couple of days. To a degree, it becomes a couple of days, even a couple of hours. A couple of minutes, you know, but it's the idea that it exists. Johnson's cut the money for Black History Month from 123,000 a year to 10 grand a year. That, that basically, in political terms, that's abolishing it. And Livingston's gone screaming all over the media in London saying, Racism! The cultural racism of the Tories is real. But the cultural racism of the Tories, this is the mayor who wants to liberate and enfranchise by giving citizenship to up to half a million illegals that he knows to be in the city. Because none of the mainstream parties will do anything to remove people who are here illegally, which they in turn say is a crime. But it's a crime about which one must do nothing. Just like in the United States. In Western Europe, people believe that George W. Bush is right wing. Is a Christian fundamentalist or something similar? Is ferocious. George W. Bush on race and immigration inside the United States is a liberal and is a humanist. There are 18 million illegal, largely Mexican 
immigrants inside the United States, 18 million, inside the Federal Union, 300 million people in the Union. Bush wants to regularise, when he was his president, he wanted to regularise that and legitimise them and bring them into citizenship. He said it was a compassionate, an American and a Christian thing to do. This is the man who's demonised as a right-wing Republican that left-wing people in California and in Western Europe grit their teeth when he came on the television with his sort of hyper-Texan, Billy Bob sort of accent, you know? Yet he, on these core issues, is a liberal. And this is the, this is the dilemma that Western populations face. The right, is li the contemporary right, the right that's allowed, is liberal. The left says it's in favour of capitalism. They all seem interchangeable. They're all engaged in a sort of political transvestism where Labour says it's tap on crime, pardon, and the tourists say they love the NHS. What's all that about? And they swap around with each other because they're all growing into each other. They're all merging into each other. You know, the days when the Tories were just middle class, they who was just working class in the unions, they're fusing into each other. They all support the same things. We've got Clegg in the middle, we've got Brown to one side, losing his temper, shoving, screaming, then crying about it on television. Have you seen the new technique? He's to cry, He's, which is what Clinton did. Whenever Clinton was in trouble, he blew. Clinton can cry for sort of money, for his mother, for heaven, for hell, for anything. He's a man who could sort of love for 10 minutes about 80 and then wonder where his burger's gone. You know, this is a man whose emotions are completely synthetic. And increasingly they do this because this is such a soft and sort of feminized and deracinated and broken down culture that male politicians appeal to the electorate by saying how weak they are and how vulnerable they are. <laughs> how you need to get in touch with their sensitive feelings and this sort of thing. In the past, leaders would talk about power and greatness and strength. But people who do that now are regarded as maniacs, you know, lunatics. You don't want to have anything to do with those nutters. You want to elect leaders who are crying into their milk about Chile and about Haiti and about everything else, about AIDS, about Africa. I have one thing to say about all these people, live aid and thereafter, who give enormous amounts of money to third world charities and so on. Vast proportion of this money is wasted. Vast proportions of it go into the hands and the pockets of militias and military dictators. It's very amusing to me that Geldof, blubbery old Geldof, with his I've taken too many strange pills, sort of a Dublin voice, is going on the BBC saying, no, 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 most of the money that we put forward, most of the money that we put forward you know, into yeah. Ethiopia, it reached the starving, that's what he was saying. Where there's a Tigrayan rebel leader, which is a part of Ethiopia, that says that in their area, 95% of this money, 95%, and he served in the government in Addis Ababa, was creamed off by his militia to buy Soviet tanks, to buy weapons. And he said, let them starve, he said, this Tigrayan leader, let them starve because we're the vanguard. We come to bar power over those that are dying. These soft liberal whites and other fools, the money comes in, we take it and we buy weapons because we want power. That's the voice of the third world. That's a voice that's been heard throughout human history down millennia. It's a voice we've forgotten here in the West because we've become too wet and too soft and too broken down and too unaware of what human life is about. And uh, in a sense, if the Western world, uh, it's Britain and all of the countries of what is conceived of as the West, do not wake up in the window that is here in the next 40 years, between now and the middle of this century. This is a key window. It's as radical as somebody who stood in 1910 and looked out at the world. Think of what awaited them and they didn't know. The First World War, the Great Crash, the false boom of the 20s, the rise of fascism and communism, the Second War, the Cold War thereafter. None of it could be predicted by a man unless he was a seer in 1910. I think we're standing in 2010 and we're looking out on a world. 34 countries are developing nuclear weapons. Iran will have them certainly in two years. They have missiles that can reach London now. North Korea has missiles that can reach the Pacific seaboard of the United States. Hundreds of millions of people are moving across continents, 
but in certain countries are dying. Some are remaining there to perish, others rule what remains. Most overall countries consist of a tiny bourgeois group, professionals, an elite at the top, which is usually military, and a mass. And there's really nothing in between, there's no middle class, essentially. Many people who think they've got a bit of them and a bit of bigger, they're trying to get into the West for a new life. And of course, if we'd been born in those groups, people with a bit of spirit and a bit of get up and go might be doing something similar. Life isn't pleasant. People do go where they see the chance is. We have to remember certain verities about life. We have to forget the blandishments of the liberal media. We have to remember that the three parties are in favour of the same things. Clegg and Brown and Cameron all support mass migration. They all support globalisation. They all support movement of capital and labour around the world. They all support the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Liberals slightly less on the war with Iraq, that's a minor difference, but in some ways that's come and gone. They all support the membership of the European Union. They all deny the people the right to vote about the Lisbon Treaty straight constitution. Brown lied, lied blatantly at the last election and said there would be a vote. That's a vote because they know they would lose it. So they all agree on it. Cameron said there'll be a vote, but now it's gone through, sorry. No vote. Can't do it. And in any case, they represent big capital through the CBI and the Institute of Directors and so forth, not small or middling capital. This means the last thing they want to do is to open up ideas about referendum, referendums on Europe, because it opens up the question, as you do genuinely say, of whether we remain in or not. So there's another issue where they're all the same. They're all the same about Sinn Féin and government in Northern Ireland. They're all the same about essentially letting Venables and Thompson out and similar extreme and egregious crimes on the margins of society. And they're all the same pretty much about political correctness. Cameron is allegedly a member of United Against Fascism. Extraordinary. When I was born, Sir Alex Douglas Hume was Tory Prime Minister. Pretty out of touch, pretty out of aristocratic, in all sorts of ways. But you imagine a snob like him would be a member of United Against Fascism or would give them money. It's extraordinary and shows you how this society has changed. Criticise homosexuality now, you face not imprisonment but a fine, cultural disprivileging, disciplining, certainly if you work in the public sector. 40 to 50 years ago, the thing itself was illegal. So you see, in issue after issue, there's been a complete reversal and transformation and turnaround. In relation to ethnicity, things could be said by the Daily Express in 1966, which would land the editor in prison, or the sub-editor, in prison now. And that's only 40 to 50 years. And it's changed because of the ideas of the people who've been educated. It's changed because of the ideas that went through the society after the 1960s, ideas which maybe 8 to 10 percent believed in now, but 88 to 90 percent of those who are educated believe in now. But there is one problem with the Liberal Project, and that is that the bulk of the people, such as in this audience tonight, don't really go along with it. Don't always have the words to challenge it, but instinctually they reject it and increasingly are looking for a way within the parceling up of what passes for democracy to vote in a manner which expresses that. And if they vote Liberal, they just ramify with what exists. If they vote Tory, they do the same. If they vote Labour, they do the same. But there is a change. There are significant working class communities, particularly in the North, but also elsewhere, who have turned on Labour now. Turned on Labour semi-tribally and as a group, and hate Labour now. Many Labour activists go on estates and they have Walkman in their ears because they don't want to hear the abuse when they go to the door. Or they sort of put the leaflet through and hurry off. Or they say, sorry mate, no, don't have a go at me, you're rock and all that, you know, me, you know. But um, I'm just delivering these things, it will be pizzas tomorrow, you know. And that's how they get out of the abuse. This is a total transformation where Labour's frightened in its own areas. The Tories never seen in those areas, let's face it, you know. They don't exist in Liverpool, you know. They come fifth, you know, Tories in Glasgow are sixth, the seventh, they're a minor party. They're not a national party at all. They exist in the South of England, where I come from, in parts of the Midlands, in rural areas. Otherwise, they're just a minority party. Uh, Labour in parts of the country are a minority party, except for certain wards. There's also a certain proportion of the population that's outside politics. I knocked on a bloke's door once, canvassing, and he came out and said, Here, mate, he said, you got any money for drugs? Straight out. Straight out, just a bang on his door, you know. And I said, no, no. And he went, well, F you then. He said, 
I'm not voting for you. But staggered, because he was seeing several of them, you know. So staggered about and then fell back into his flat. And he's not alone, you see, because in a sense he's outside the system. He's outside the system. Even New Labour, they're a bunch of what's it, you know. And there's a degree to which, as the society fractures, the ability of people to rely on core votes is increasingly in jeopardy. Labour have a subtext to the enormous migration they've allowed in. 90% of all post-Africans and Afro-Caribbeans, 90% vote Labour if they vote at all. 55 to 75% of all Asians if they vote at all, and unless they're angry about a certain thing, such as an attack on a Muslim country, they vote Labour. So you see there's an inbuilt factor by the creation of these large wedges of population, as Enoch Powell once described them in a manner Trevor Phillips wouldn't care for, to vote a particular way. But there are proportions of the society now that will never vote Labour again. And even if it's only a protest vote, in the UKIP rise in middle class areas at the European elections, you see a bourgeois protest in part against the structure. What UKIP does is they channel nationalistic feeling in a moderate and slightly faffy way. People who don't want to go outside, don't want to be accused of something, don't want to take the heat and all the rest of it. Don't want to be described as politically incorrect, all the nasty words that go with that. So channel it through the European thing. You know, you can see for a lot of middle class people it's a safe option for that. But the blocks are breaking. And they're cracking. And if they crack a bit more, major representation will be achieved across the society. The taking of cities like Stoke, parliamentary candidates in Westminster, certainly if the parliament is hung, it's the best possible result for the radical right. Because it will be hung, and PR will come, an English parliament will come, a democratic lord, a so-called senate and so on, will come, because at the moment the lords is just stuck for the Blairs and Browns cronies. You just give Lord Desai a very, you know, an, an estimable, you know, Lord Ali, the, the country's first Muslim homosexual peer, as he describes himself, you know. Um, and all these people, they're not lords of the man, of course not. They're just cronies and mates of the party leaders who've been got in. Better to have a democratic assembly. And partly people get so sick of voting for all these things, they've been elected every other week, that their radicalism will grow. And the desire to kick electorally and politically, the desire to boot the ball into the sand, the desire to vote against the Liberals, against Labour, against the Conservatives, even against the other minority parties, the Celtic Nationalist parties, in their particular dispensations, will grow, and will grow, and will grow again. And there's one party that they need to vote for now and into the future, a party which is white, red, and blue, irrespective of constitutional changes that are forced from without, and that will, in the fullness of time, actually have little effect in the way the society perceives these matters as things get more complicated. Old patriotic labour, the social values of militant conservatism, and the indigenous character of the country combined in its national emblem, there needs to be a breakthrough by one party and one party alone. And I ask you in the weeks that remain until May the 6th to vote for this party when the election comes, to leave it for this party, to canvass for it, to buy propaganda on behalf of it, to listen for it on the media and control the internet to see what is said about it, particularly when it's on the party's own vehicles, to support candidates, to put money in buckets and to give funds so that people can stand locally, regionally and nationally and internationally by Europe. And when people ask you on May the 7th, who did you vote for? You say, I voted for the British National Party. Thank you very much.